Hello, and welcome to Developing Flexible Authorization Capabilities with ASP.NET Core. I'm Jason Taylor, an SSW Solution Architect and Consultant. I help companies develop, build, test, and deliver solutions to the cloud. You can find me on Twitter at JasonTaylorDev or on my blog, JasonTaylor.dev. I've got to say, wow, we're here live tonight with a live audience, and it's been a long time since I've presented live. It's probably since 2019, end of 2019, that I've stood in front of a camera. And for all of those years, I've been sitting in my desk, in my comfortable chair, in my nice warm room. And it's, it's great to be on stage again, but boy, after a couple of years, you sure get used to that. So tonight, we're here to talk about authorization. But before we get started, I just wanted to mention that SSW have a cool new app. It's the SSW Rewards app, and you can search for it in the App Store and download it. Uh, you can, at the end of this presentation, I'll share a QR code with you. You can scan that QR code to earn points and claim prizes. It's good fun. You should check it out. All right. This talk tonight will cover authorization with ASP.NET Core, authorization in Blazor WebAssembly. I've got a sample app that's being built in Blazor WebAssembly with an ASP.NET Core uh, backend. Uh, we're going to look at the standard approach to authorization. And then we're going to look at a flexible approach to authorization with ASP.NET Core. Then I'm going to walk through the code with you and show you how it all fits together. So a little bit of background information before we get started. So authentication is the process of determining the user's identity. But authorization is the process which determines which resources a user can access. So while authentication is independent of authorization, authorization requires an authenticated user. So authorization determines access to resources, but what specifically is a resource? Well, a resource could be a file, or it could be a feature, or it could be some data. Resource can mean different things. So authorization includes defining access control rules as policies, which will be used by the system to grant or reject access to uh, resources. So the focus of this talk tonight will be authorization with ASP Net Core, and I will demonstrate how to define and enforce access policies using the simplest approach to authorization with ASP Net Core, but also a more flexible approach to authorization. And I will um, show that for sufficiently complex solutions, the simple approach is not going to be that easy to maintain and to um, to, to, to work with long term, especially for a large organization with, uh, with a lot of uh, kind of roles. So the sample code is, uh, sorry, just one, one thing. Uh, the sample code for this solution is in Blazor WebAssembly and it's hosted on ASP.NET Core. And I'm gonna share a link to the code and slides at the end of the presentation. All right, so with ASP.NET Core authorization, it supports simple authorization capabilities, such as ensuring that a user is authenticated, and also supports more sophisticated authorization capabilities, such as role-based, claims-based, policy-based, and more. Additionally, it's relatively straightforward to create custom authentication policies, sorry, authorization policies, and it's also relatively easy to customize the behavior of the authorization middleware. We're going to do some of that customization tonight, but before we get started, let's have a look at the basics so that we're all on the same page. So in its simplest form, authorization in ASP.NET Core works by applying an authorized attribute to a controller action or page. You can see in this example, we've applied the authorized attribute to the account controller. And that means that anyone who wants to access the actions within the account controller will need to be authenticated. So minimum level of authorization. In this next example, we've moved that authorized attribute from the accounts controller and down to a specific action. Because we actually, you know, you might not have noticed that we fixed a bit of a bug there. Only authorized users could hit the login action, so nobody could log in at that stage. So we've shifted that down there. So now with this kind of strategy, the authorized attribute is on logout. So you have to be an authenticated user to log out. And then um, the login action is available to anonymous users. Another way of doing that is to put the authorized attribute on the controller and then using the allow anonymous attribute on the login action. That will achieve the same thing. So it just depends on how you want to work with it and what makes sense and the number of actions that you have as to how you use that. 
So in the next example, we can talk about ASP.NET Core and how it supports role-based authorization, again, using the authorized attribute. So in this example, the authorized attribute has been applied to the administrator controller and access has been restricted to users who have been authenticated and who belong to the role administrators. Therefore, access in the controller requires an authenticated user in the administrator role. All right, and here we have the same authorized attribute, but we've added one more role to it. So we have the accounts role. So that means that it requires an authenticated user who's a member of the accounts role or the administrator's role. It doesn't have to be both, so just one role will suffice. And next up, we have two authorized attributes, both specifying uh, one role. And this means that the user now must be a member of both the administrator's role and the accounts role in order to gain access to the actions within this controller. So you can see you can combine and compose these attributes to specify the requirements that you want to convey. Now, if I had, uh, let's say, administrators and power users in the first line, then the authorization policy would change. It would be first you have to be a member of administrators or power users and also a member of accounts. OK, so we can set this up in a fairly effective way. So next up, we have policy-based authorization with ASP.NET Core, again, using the authorized attribute. In this example, we have specified that the policy to be enforced is the employees only policy. And that means that an authenticated user must meet the requirements of the employees only policy. And we haven't specified the requirements here. We do that elsewhere. So looking at this, the most simplest way to create a custom policy is to build an add and register the policy when registering the authorization service. So in this example, the employees only policy has a single requirement. It simply requires that the authenticated user have a claim employee number, and it doesn't matter what the value is, just that they have that claim. All right, now we're going to talk about authorization in Blazor WebAssembly. So as I said, the sample code tonight will be Blazor WebAssembly, so it's good to get started here. It has similar authorization capabilities uh, as ASP.NET Core, because of course Blazor WebAssembly is an ASP.NET Core technology. Uh, and so you still gain access to the authorized attribute, but there's some all, also some components that you can leverage um, for building out your views. So you have the capability to assess uh, simple authorization rules and allow uh, authenticated users uh, you can write your authorization based on roles, claims, policies um, as per ASP.NET Core. Uh, you can use the authorized view, which allows you to set up um, rendering of partial UI elements based on the results of some authorization check. And the same thing with the authorized route view, you can restrict access to um, specific resources. So having said that, it's important to remember that with Blazor WebAssembly, these checks are only for the UI or the user experience. It provides a good user experience. Um, they, they can't really be enforced because the code, as, as with all single page applications, is sitting on the client's computer and they can easily bypass those checks. Um, so we need to remember to enforce all of this in the back end as well. Let's take a look at some quick examples with Blazor WebAssembly now. So with Blazor WebAssembly, the same authorized attribute can be applied to a routable page. So in this example, we've applied just the attribute authorized, which means to access this home page, you have to be an authenticated user. In this next example, we've applied the authorized attribute and we specified certain roles. So the roles for this um, access is administrators or accounts. And as before, that means you need to be a member of either the administrators or the accounts role to access the account, uh, the counter page. And next we have the uh, user page where we've specified a policy. So to access the users page, you must adhere to the requirements of the employees only policy, which as we saw, just has one requirement and that is you must have an employee number claim. All right, so next we have the authorized view component, which allows us to selectively display content. In this example, this is a nav menu. We can see that uh, any authenticated user can see the home link in the nav menu. For the uh, counter link, it requires that you're either in the role of administrators and accounts. And for the users link, it, it uh, requires that you meet the requirements of the employees only policy. So you can see what we did um, for each routable page, we also had to do in the nav menu. Uh, 
All right, and here's another example of authorized view where we say the user's not authorized. So we go ahead and just show the login link. So you can see authorized view is quite useful in customizing the content. OK, so now I want to do a quick demonstration. And in this demo, we're going to do something fairly simple. We're going to add a new role to the system using a um, um, using the basic approach to authorization with ASP.NET Core. And so the role that we're going to add is an auditor role. Um, we have some auditors joining the company, and they want to review the application. And so we've got to get them set up. So let's have a look here. So I've got my app here. I'm just going to start it up so we can have a look at the uh, basic um, functionality before we go ahead and add the auditor role. All right, so I'll start by logging in. Now I've created some basic accounts for this app, and you'll be able to use the same accounts when you get access to the source code. So I've got an auditor account, but they don't have access to anything currently. So the system is set up. It's using role-based authorization, and um, everything's nice and secure. So if I log back out and log in as the admin, we should be able to see the functionality. OK, so the admin has access to the home page, the counter page, the fetch page, the ability to view users and to edit users. So we can edit the order to user and we can assign them to one or more roles. Um, we won't do that yet because there's not a role um, really suitable for them. We're going to create one. I've also created this little claims page, um, which you can see exposes the role one or more um, through individual uh, role claims. OK, so we've got some documentation as well because we're using role based authorization, right? It's kind of hard to um, know who has access to what. So I've created a nice little markdown page because it's good to program in markdown and we can see here the permissions that everyone has. And we have to keep this up to date. We have to keep this up to date and in line with the source code. Otherwise, you know, in six months time, as this application grows and evolves and organizations restructure and new roles are created and destroyed, we won't know who has access to what. So this is our really our only way of keeping track of that. So we're gonna have to come in here and add a new auditor's role and decide what permissions they have. But for now, let's give them the access to um, count things. They can count things like the accounts department, um, check the forecasts like the operations people before they go on site, and uh, let's see, maybe view users as well. So we'll just give them a few permissions. So to do that, we'll, we'll come back to the documentation. We'll, we'll do that later. Uh, we need to start by adding a new role. And I've got a nice little DB initializer to do that. There's the default password for all newly created users. So we'll go ahead and create a constant to represent our role. Compress control D. And this is my favorite shortcut, shift alt dot. And then auditors, there we go. And now we'll come down here. We'll duplicate this one. Let's make that a bit bigger, there we go. We'll duplicate this one and make this the new auditors role. OK, try again. So. OK, and that's about it. That's all we need to do right there. So this initializer is going to run on startup and it'll pop that new auditors role in for us. Um, but of course, the role is not going to have access to anything. We need to go and update our authorized attributes and our uh, authorized view and make sure that the auditor is actually going to see things. So let's go and do that now. Where should we start? We'll start we'll start on the Blazor front end. Um, so we've got we've got the new auditors role. It's going to be called auditors and uh, we'll come to the nav menu first. Let's make sure that it can access stuff uh, in the nav menu. So you can see here I've got some authorized views already. So we've got administrators and accounts who can access counter. So we'll go ahead and pop in auditors. And then we've got administrators and operations can access fetch data. And then we've got just administrators can access uh, users. And 
we'll put auditors there as well. But I think that was all we were going to, going to give them access to. So uh, let's go ahead and, and run that and see if we can get the auditors with some level of access, even though they still won't have access to the underlying pages. Uh, and they're certainly not going to have access to the controllers on the back end. So give that a second to spin up. Didn't fail, do it. Hopefully not. Is it running? Looking good. Okay. So first thing I want to do is just assign the auditor to the new auditor's role. So that's appeared now. So we'll go ahead and click save. Um, and now we'll just log out and sign in as an auditor and see what they can see. go okay good so they can see the counter page but they're not authorized to actually access the page because we've got the authorized attribute there they can't see fetch data and they can't see users but they can see the nav menu item so that's a good start so now not flexible auth we're not there yet so over here we'll start with counter so here we'll go ahead and add the auditors role there Uh, and here we'll go fetch data, and here we will, don't do that, we'll go into users and index and pop it there. So now we'll do hot reload, which will probably tell me it just needs to do a full rebuild and restart everything, which is fine. We'll do that. Give me a sec, I think it's good to go. There we go. Okay, so what do we got? We got the home page. We've got the counter page that's now working. Uh, fetch data is not working because it's trying to access data on the back end. It's not authorized to do yet. And users is not working. Same deal. So now let's go to the back end and update our authorization checks there. So we've got in the back end controllers, admin, roles, users, and weather forecasts. So we'll start with roles. They're going to need access to see the roles. Uh, they're going to need access to see the users and they're going to need access to get a weather forecast. So we'll save that, hot reload. Okay, good. So now they've got access to counter, access to fetch data, access to users. Gee, can it get any easier than that? That was pretty nice. Um, all right, let's continue. And so what did we do? To add a single role to an existing system with a simple set of features required code changes. It required testing. We didn't do that, but I'm sure we'll get to it soon. Um, we needed to build. We didn't deploy it yet, but we will have to do a deployment to production so that users can start using this role. Um, we've got some documentation. We're going to update that soon too, um, hopefully and probably some bug fixes, right? It's a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of hard work just to bring in a simple role. And um, we weren't even building a new feature. We just wanted to add a role. So that's the standard approach. Yes, of course. Uh, so is this uh, the ECF core seeding behind the scenes when you had a role or not? Yes, EF core is seeding in the back end. Um, so let me, let, me, um, let me show you that. So, with this basic auth uh, that's happening, this solution, we've got a DB initializer and it runs when the application starts, which as we all know, should only be used for development purposes, which this is. Uh, and so you can see here, it's got this run async method. The first thing it will do is create the database if it doesn't exist, update it to the latest migrations, then it will create some roles. Don't really care whether they exist or not because identity is nice enough just not to recreate them for us if they if they um, already exist. Then we do the same thing with an admin user, then we do the same thing with an auditor user, and we simply save our changes. So when we run the application, we can be assured that the state is uh, uh, going to be ready for us. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about database initialization, you can actually check out my blog. I try to blog once a week. I've blogged once in the last three years, I think. And um, <laughs> it was this year, so, and it's on uh, EF core uh, initialization. So you might, you might like to check that out. It's related to this, so. All right, I'm gonna blog every week from now though. So we'll see. Okay, so we're looking at, let's see, 
flexible authorization with ASP.NET Core. So for a simple uh, application with a small user base, anything more than that's probably overkill. Um, if you only have two roles, such as administrators and users, it, it, anything more might be a bit too much. Um, but for most production applications, especially if it's in a large organization, uh, and a flexible approach will be essential, uh, an approach that will um, help us to isolate uh, organizational changes from application code base. So let me just check this. All right. So what do we want in a flexible approach to authorization? Well, I want to easily add new roles and configure access control. That, that needs to be simple. I need to be able to easily reconfigure access control for existing roles. That's a kind of a small thing, right? I want to remove roles without impacting existing access control checks. OK, I, roles should not be tied to the code. And I want to easily view the access control policies. I've got a markdown file for that at the moment, which, as we know, is already out of date. Um, but we want to make all of this easy. So I want to support all of these things as part of standard application features. I don't want to have to do any of this in code. So let's have a look at what it would look like if we wanted to add a new auditor role in an application that does kind of adhere to these flexible authorization uh, practices. So we can go ahead and close this basic one. Don't do that. I'm just going to click here. And we'll fire up. I think that's good. And we'll fire up this flexible auth one. Run in here. And so I've tried to, uh, this, this application is as close to the uh, basic auth one as possible in terms of functionality. Just all of the things that we need to make it as flexible as possible. Let's have a look. Okay. Give it a second. Let's see if it's crashed or something weird. I don't think so. There we go. Log in. So we've got the same accounts available here. The DB initializer is fairly similar. Password. One, two, three. Okay. So we have all of the same features, but we've also got roles. So we can add and remove and edit roles as necessary. And we also have access control. Looks pretty similar to the documentation, right? So now let's add the auditor role. Let's set the access control for the auditor role. They want to view users. They want to count things and check the weather. And let's make sure that the auditor has the auditor role. OK, now let's log out and log back in as the auditor. All right, so the auditor can access the home page, counter, fetch data, the users. But this time it's read only, they don't have any edit links, and their claims. That's everything, right? How simple is that? We didn't have to make any code changes. We didn't have to fix any bugs. We didn't have to update documentation. Uh, yeah, we didn't have to deploy it. We didn't have to build. We don't have to do any of that. So let's compare these approaches. Pretty simple. So with the standard approach to ASP Net Core authorization using role-based access control, we had to make code changes. We didn't really like that. We had to test it. We didn't do that. We had to build and deploy it. We, we'll get to that. Uh, we haven't updated the documentation yet. We'll get to that too. Uh, and we probably have to make some bug fixes because we made so many changes across so many different areas of our system, especially for a large system, right? This is just a sample. It's relatively simple, but you can see the difference. It's massive. So with the flexible approach, it uh, resulted in more free time. So we could fix bugs or build a new feature, right? We didn't even have to be there because we put the capability to make those changes to our application users, to our administrators. All right, so now I want to show you the source code. But before we do that, I really need to set the scene. So with flexible authorization, we had permissions. And uh, we saw those. Let's just go back there. We saw those permissions represented in our little access control page. Log in as administrator. <clears throat> 
OK, so here's our permissions and there's our roles. Now with the permissions, they define granular access to some resource. Developers create permissions as necessary, and I'm going to show you how to do that. We'll spend a fair bit of time on that. Um, permissions are not assigned directly to a user. Rather, permissions are assigned to a role, and of course, the user inherits the permissions for any assigned roles. So if the user is a member of many roles, they get many permissions from many roles assigned to them, and that will then appear as a claim in their identity. Next up, we have roles. So roles define a logical grouping of users, and oftentimes it represents the organizational hierarchy. Administrators can create new roles as required. Administrators assign permissions to roles, such as through the access control page, and role-based authorization should be avoided. So if we want a flexible approach to authorization, we really need to avoid role-based authorization at all costs, because it was that um, type of access control check that we had to change for adding something as simple as a new role. Now you can imagine how much more complex it would be for a large application for something like an organizational restructure where people change all the department names across all of IT. Now, it might not, might not sound like a common scenario, but it happened to me twice in eight years. Um, so it's pretty common and you can't just leave those old names in there because it confused the new people, right? So we have to fix that up. All right, so then we have the engine. What's happening behind the scenes? Well, you might think, wow, this is cool, but you probably had to write your own security, right? Which we know is not a good thing. Well, actually, no. I was able to leverage ASP.NET Core authorization. So ASP.NET Core has a very powerful and extensible policy-based authorization system, which is at the heart of it. And so it's being built using that. And in fact, I'm just using a custom authorizer attribute, which will allow the developers to specify the permissions that are required and what happens behind the scenes is those permissions are translated into a policy name. So it'd be kind of like if you had an authorized attribute and you said policy equals permission one. Instead, you have an authorized attribute and you just list the permissions that you want. That gets translated into a policy name. And then we have a policies being dynamically created using a custom policy provider. So we specify the permissions and the engine creates the policy when needed, when the authorization check needs to be performed and uh, verifies that the identity meets the requirements of that policy. So that's what's happening behind the scenes, but let's have a look at the code to get a really good understanding of it. So I've created my first .NET interactive notebook, so we can have some fun with that. So you can see here, we've got an example of a set of permissions. It's an enumeration, but it's a special type. It's a C-sharp flags enumeration. And applying that attribute basically means instead of just representing a single value, we can represent a set of values or a set of flags, in this case, a set of permissions. So just jumping ahead a little bit, that means we could say, hey, the user permissions are permissions A and permission C. That's what they have. And the required permissions, we know required permissions, you know, if we were assigning them to an authorized attribute, that would be or. So the required permissions would be permissions A or permissions B. Now, what does all that mean? Well, because they're flags, they're just little bit flags. And so if we wanted to say that permissions A um, and permission C, uh, the user permissions, then that's just, um, I'm not going to say all the zeros, one plus 100 equals 101, which is equivalent to five, right? So the value for user permissions expressed as an int is five. And the required permissions is one plus 10 equals 11 or three. So binary to uh, decimal. So the value would be three. So let's, let's just run this and let's run this first one. So we'll output the permissions as a string. That's kind of interesting. What are the user permissions? And what are the required permissions? So user permissions, A and C. We get comma separated values for all of the specified flags. The required permissions, A and B. Let's have a look at the numeric value. User permissions, five. Required permissions, three. You'll understand why this is so important once we start generating policy names. Now, if we want to check the permissions, we can say uh, user permissions dot has flag required permissions. Now, you'd think this check should pass, but it actually fails and that's because of the way that we want to evaluate our permissions, right? The required permissions, we don't need both of them, just one of them. So it's always or. And in this case, it was A or B. 
Now, if we change user permissions to A and B, that's going to pass. But um, this particular user doesn't have authorization for B. So we have to change our approach a little bit. So if we come down here, first thing we want to do is just get a list of all of the permissions available. And so we're basically getting a list which contains permission A, B, C, D, E. Also none and all, but we're not really too worried about those ones uh, at this stage. So we get our required permissions list and then we simply, uh, so we've got all our all permissions list and then we loop through that list and evaluate each permission against the required permissions. So we say if the required permissions has that permission, then we add it to a simple list of required permissions. And it's that list that we then authorize against. So you can see here, we start by saying we're not authorized. We def deny access by default. Then we loop through the required permissions list and we simply say, hey, if the user permissions has this flag, this permission, that's good enough. We only need one in this particular list. So they are authorized. We drop out of the loop and we return the result. So let's have a look at that. So authorized equals true. Now, just a couple of simple operations. We've got this logical or operator where we can use it to update the user permissions. They've got A and C. Now they've also got B. Over here, we can remove the permissions using the logical XOR operator. Now they're back to A and C, we've removed B. And now I want to look at how we're going to generate these policy names based on the required permissions. So I'll just, just to set the scene a little bit, we'll have some authorize attributes. Right, let's just try it. Let's just go back right to the start. Authorize. And we will say, uh, it's a, attributes, right? So we've got to put it attributes. We've got to put it in the square brackets. Permissions dot A or permissions dot C. Oh, that's the that's the uh, user permissions. So it's going to look like that. And based on this, we want to generate a policy name. So we start with this policy prefix. That will be the starting part of our policy name. And then we simply convert the required permissions to an int and add that to the prefix. So if we have a look at this, we've got our required permissions A and B, which has the value of three and the policy name will be permissions three. So we're generating policy names for policies that don't yet exist, but one day will exist when we when we create those two um, on the fly. So here's another one. We've got required permissions. We're going to update that to A, B and C. Run it again. Required permissions A, B and C with a value of seven, which will require permissions seven. So that particular policy. Now we can also take a policy name and get the permissions from that. So we've got a permissions value from this policy, permission seven. So if we have a look at that, the policy name was permission seven, and we know that based on that value, the required permissions are A, B, and C, because we can quite simply cast an int back to the permissions type and get the required um, permissions. Now, does anyone have any questions on any of that before we continue? We we'll get to dive deeper into the source code now, so it's good to have that foundation. All right, let's do it. So we can put that away for now. That's in the code base as well. Let's have a look at flexible auth. Where should we start? Maybe on the server. OK, so if we have a look at program.cs here, let's just stop that running. We won't need that at the moment. We've got a little bit of customization here. So we're, we're adding API authorization. You might see sometimes um, this, and we're adding the roles claim and the permissions claim. They're not exposed by default. And if you don't do that, then you're not going to get your roles available in your Blazor WebAssembly app. When you do expose it this way, it ends up as an array of roles. And so you actually need a little bit more functionality on the Blazor front end which we've got here in authorization, we've created a, a custom accounts claims principal factory, which will then detect if a claim is an array type and split it out into individual claims. And so that has to be registered also, which happens here. All right, so a little bit of setup required that, and, and that's required um, for role-based, on Blazor WebAssembly, and also um, you saw we were exposing the permissions claim, which we'll be using shortly. So I want to look at the authorized attribute first. That's probably the best place to start. 
So the authorize attribute is sitting here in this shared, and it's called authorize attribute. You can see that I've named it the same and based it directly off the Microsoft ASP.NET Core authorization authorize attribute. All I've really done is created a couple of constructors to, to allow it to work, um, to behave normally. Those constructors exist on the authorize attribute. And then I've created a new one so that I can pass in the permissions. Okay, so that means that we can pass permissions directly in via constructor. We also have a property called permissions. And you can see here, we're not actually setting a backing value for permissions because we want to make this as uh, seamless as possible to tie into ASP.NET Core authorization as much as possible. So we're just setting the policy name, which would be the same as setting the policy name yourself. So what we do, if we're setting it, we check that the policy value is not equal to permissions um, dot none. And if it is equal to permissions dot none, then we just don't set a policy name. The reason for that is because if someone's put an authorized attribute and they say it doesn't require any permissions, well, we're saying, okay, well, you must mean authorized with just an authenticated user. So by not setting the policy name, it falls back to its default behavior, which is just an authenticated user. Otherwise, we go ahead and generate a policy name. Now you've seen how we do that. We combine a prefix and the value of the required permissions to create that name. And that's happening in this policy name helper. So we say generate a policy name for these permissions. So if we go and look at that, you can see that's all it's doing. It's combining the value of the permissions with the prefix for the policy name. Now back over here, um, if we were to get the value, then it has to evaluate what the permissions are based on the policy name. So we just check to see if the policy name is empty. Um, if it is, then we just return permissions.none. Uh, and if it if not, then we use the policy name helper to get permissions from the policy name. And in this case, we're just pulling out the value into permissions value and casting it directly to permissions. So really, ignore the policy name helper. We've now got an authorized attribute which we can pass permissions to. And let's have a quick let's have a look at that just really quickly. So perhaps if we go to the weather forecast controller, we can see at the top that to, to access the weather forecast controller, you must hold the forecast permission, okay? And we know that having done that, it's setting the policy behind the scenes. Now we can do that a different way. Forecast permission value is 64, right? And it's the only permission required. So we could actually do this. I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is the way to do it. I'm just making a point. I think it was permissions 64. Let's just check the prefix on that. Can't quite this one. Yeah, permissions. Okay. Same thing, right? It's the same thing as what we're doing. Let, let me let me get them both up. Right. These two do exactly the same thing. So this one sets the forecast, um, sets the permission to uh, forecast, which has a value of 64, which will behind the scenes set the policy name to permission 64, right? So we've just made it easier to specify the policy using basic ASP.NET Core authorization functionality. So let's leave like that like that. So now that we have the authorize attribute and now that we've dynamically generated a policy name, how does the policy get created? Well, it gets created automatically using this flexible authorization policy provider which is uh, based on the default authorization policy provider that comes with ASP.NET Core. All it does is try to use the default authorization policy provider to get the policy if it exists. And it may already exist. You know, if this particular policy has already been generated, we're not going to generate a second time. We'll just generate it the first time it's required. So you can see here, we check to see if it's null. And um, if it is null, then we check with the policy name helper, is it a valid policy name? Right, so does it start with the prefix? Does it have an int value, that sort of thing? And if it is, then we simply get the permissions value from that policy name and we build a, using the standard authorization policy builder, we build a new policy to um, specify those permissions as a requirement of that policy. So now ASP.NET Core will be able to evaluate that policy and ensure that the user has the appropriate permissions. How does it do that? Well, we also had to create a permission authorization requirement. And it is derived, it, sorry, it implements the I authorization requirement interface 
and simply allows us to pass in the permissions value and to store that permissions value. Now, I authorization requirements have handlers so that they can be evaluated. So the permission authorization handler will take a permission authorization requirement, which you can see, let's make that bigger. You can see right here and evaluate it. And this is what you saw before when we were looking at the um, notebook. So first thing it does is to make sure that it has a permissions claim. If it doesn't, we're done. And that means that this um, requirement will not be satisfied and authorization will fail. If it does have um, a claim, then we make sure that it's a, a value that we can use so that it's an int. If not, we bail. Otherwise, we get all of the permissions and we build a list of the required permissions. Because remember, it, um, we don't have to satisfy all of the permissions, just one. So we build that list in the same way that we did before. And then once we've got the required permissions as a list, we can then go and assess uh, the user's permissions against the required permissions. So you can see here, we loop through, and if the user has one of those permissions, it will immediately succeed and return, and that's it. So let's see, we have an authorized attribute, which allows you to set some permissions. Those permissions are translated into a policy name. When ASP.NET Core tries to authorize that request, it will then use the default, uh, sorry, the flexible um, authorization policy builder, where is it? To create that policy as required, it will specify the requirement, permission authorization requirement with the necessary permissions, which will then use the handler to evaluate if the identity or the user uh, meets the requirements of that policy. All right. Any questions at that stage? No problem. Let's see what else we have. So we have some custom claim types. That's just a constant for us to use. We've got a nice I authorization service extension. So if you do need to do some authorization checks in procedural code, one of the ways to do that is to inject an I authorization service, and you can call one of the many authorized async methods to check particular um, um, uh, authorization requirements. So in this case, I've just created an additional method which will actually um, give in a user and a set of permissions, go ahead and generate the necessary policy name and pass that through to ASP Net Core authorization to do its work. And of course, it's going to then use the policy builder to build that policy if it hasn't already and assess the requirements. All right. We've looked at that one. We've looked at this one. Uh, permissions provider is just a way of getting a list of all permissions that exist in the permissions uh, enum. And the policy name helper just has a couple of helper methods. Here's valid policy name, generate policy name for a set of permissions and get permissions from a policy name. All right. So let's have a look at what else can we see? Let's have a look at how it's used, all right? So in the access control controller, we have permissions defined as configure access control. We don't have any roles defined anywhere. So we know that the authorization strategy for this particular controller says that a user must have the permission configure access control to access anything uh, in this controller to access get configuration or to update the configuration. Roles controller, we have view roles on the get method, and we have manage roles on the post method. And this is a much more finer grained approach than we could have had with a role-based authorization approach. Users controller, we have view users and manage users for get users, and just view users for get user, depending on what, you, what strategy um, you're using, you'll tailor that approach. Here we have manage users to update a user, there we go. Weather forecast controller we already saw. Permission stop forecast. Now, one thing I didn't show you is how we wire up those um, requirements, uh, the, the permissions requirement and the uh, policy uh, builder, and that happens here. So you can see here we register the uh, permission authorization handler as an I authorization handler, and we uh, register the policy builder as a policy builder. Now, what happens when we get to the front end, right? We don't have 
a policy generation engine on the front end on Blazor WebAssembly. We don't have um, these these authorization handlers, or do we? We do because it's Blazor WebAssembly. It's ASP.NET Core. We've got C Sharp running in the browser now. So yeah, we're wiring up the authorization handlers and the policy builder, and we can assess those same authorization requirements on the front end. Keeping in mind, it's just to provide the best user experience possible because they can all be bypassed, um, but it's useful to have on the front end. So if we look at how we're using this on the front end, um, let's start with the nav menu. So the nav menu is here. And so you can see I have have a custom component called flexible authorized view. Before we were just looking at authorized view, this one's a little bit fancier. So it's right here. Flexible authorized view, of course, is based on the existing authorized view and just provides one more property, the permissions property. So now we can go ahead and set permissions uh, for our authorized view. And we can use it in the same way that we would use um, the standard authorized view. So I specify flexible authorized view, and this requires permissions of counter. And if the user meets those requirements, it will show this piece of content. Same thing with forecast. Here, it's view users or manage users. If you've got one of those, you can see a list of users. Here, you just need to be authenticated and you'll be able to take a look at your claims. Here, you need view roles, roles or manage roles to see a list of roles. And here, we've got configure access control to access the access control page. So that's from the nav menu. We've got authorize on all the pages as well. So if we go to access control, you can see that same authorized attribute that we built and used in the server, we're using on the back end here. So authorize requires permissions configure access control. Roles, edit roles, sorry, edit, uh, edit users, list users, view users or manage users. And we've got claims, claims we haven't put anything on. So we, we messed up there. What do we, what do we want for that nav menu? Claims wanted a authenticated user, right? Just a simple authorized. So we can go ahead and update that now. So we can go attribute, authorize, and that'll do. All right. Uh, so the user couldn't have seen the option in the nav menu, but then they could have navigated directly to that page um, by typing in the route. Counter, fetch data and our home page, which has no authorization requirements. All right, uh, don't need to look at that. What else have we got? I think that's pretty much everything. All right, back to the slides. So now I wanted to demonstrate uh, one last concept before we continue. Uh, before we wrap things up, and that's to demo adding a new requirement. Uh, as an auditor, I would like to know who has access to which resources. So they want access to the access control page. And um, to do that, we're going to have to create a read-only view of the access control page and then set the necessary permissions. So let's do that. So to add a new permission, we go to our list of permissions here and create a new value. View access control. And now we need to specify authorization requirements for the feature. So let's see. If we start at controllers, access control controller, currently you require configure access control to access anything. We'll take that off there. Put this one to view access control. And we'll put this one as configure access control. So this is updating configuration. This is getting configuration. So we're done there. So now we'll update the front end. So in the nav menu, we want someone with view access control to be able to get there. So we'll just copy and paste. I probably need that again. OK, so they can see the item in the nav menu. Now we need to ensure that they can actually access the page. So we'll update the authorized attribute here. 
And now we need to implement the functionality. Currently, we have an edit mode only. Um, they wouldn't be able to kind of update the access control because we've already locked that down on the controller, um, but they can still click the checkbox. Um, so we could do that just using our uh, flexible authorized view would be one simple way to do it. So let's just get that in. I'll copy that into clipboard. Flexible authorized view. Okay. Whoops. Bit of a mess there. And we can say permissions equals whoops. Permissions dot access control and so we'll have we'll use the authorized component and pop that in so if they have configure access control they'll see this input and then we'll say if they're not authorized don't have access control and we'll display this input and we'll get rid of that and we'll just say it's disabled okay so we've implemented our new feature which is a read-only view of the access control page we've also created an associated permission and so that we can uh, secure that with the right authorization requirements so if i did everything right we should be good to go so i'll run that uh, what's happening behind the scenes now is the DB initializer is running and it's checking to make sure that the administrator has all permissions and it will assign that new permission automatically to the administrator. So we'll start by logging in. That didn't work. I didn't type that password in wrong once tonight, which is amazing. Uh, access control, looking good so far. There's view access control, good. We can grant that to the auditors. Um, and access control seems to be working, at least for an administrator, so we did something right. Let's log out, log back in, find the auditor. In, and they can see access control now. They can go to it. They can't change anything. So job done. All right. So in order to add a permission to support the new requirement, we had to make some code changes. We had to do some testing. We'll get to that soon and build and deploy. Uh, but none of this was extra work, right? We had to build a new feature. That was the read only view of access control. So it's not the same as when we added a role. So this is good. It was relatively simple to put those permissions in place and it's going to be simple to understand them and maintain them in the future. Right, so that's it for tonight. In this talk, we looked at the standard approach to authorization with ASP.NET Core. I shared some background information and samples for authorization with ASP.NET Core and Blazor WebAssembly. I demonstrated the typical approach using role-based access control. And we saw that for a very simple requirement, adding the new auditor role, we really had to jump through a lot of hoops. There was a lot of code to write. There was a lot of testing that we didn't do that we'll get to soon. We will have to build it, we'll have to deploy it, and we still have to document those changes, which we didn't get to. I then demonstrated a more flexible approach using permission-based control. And so with this approach, adding a new auditor role was trivial. And so for a simple application with a small user base, you know, with maybe an administrator role or a user role, yes, this might be overkill, but it's not typically the applications we build. For most applications in production, especially those with large, within large organizations, a flexible approach will be required. An approach such as this helps to isolate your code base from these types of organizational changes. And that puts the power into the hands of the administrators and the users rather than the developers. If you like what you saw tonight and you'd like to check out the code, uh, you can grab the code, the slides, and the little permissions notebook that I put together. And as promised, here's the QR code. So if you scan it, you can collect some points and earn some prizes.
All right. I hope you've enjoyed the talk tonight. It was great to see so many of you in person. As I said, it's been a few years. Thank you very much. Oh, with the questions. Sounds good. I mean, asking your questions. We can do this. So one of the questions that came up early and also reappeared yes. was what happens if you have too many permissions? Yes, of course. So the permissions uh, enumeration with the flags attribute that we're using is int based and that means 32 bits. So that's a maximum of 32 permissions. So if we have more than that, obviously we're going to run into trouble. Now we can change that to a long and get 64 permissions, but that's still not a lot for uh, a large organization, right? Which is exactly what we're talking about. So that being the case, it's not too much trouble to customize this solution to support multiple sets of permissions. You'll create multiple sets of permissions. They'll have distinct policy names being generated and you can extend your authorization attribute to support those different types of permissions. Now, if you want a different approach, uh, that doesn't suffer from that limitation, which I think is okay. Um, you can use a, a static class with constants in it, and uh, then you can just combine the value of your claim in a different way to represent the value of the permissions that the user has, and of course the value of um, the required permissions. So I kind of like sticking with the, the, the flags enumeration. It might seem like a limitation, like 3264, it's not much, but it allows you to organize your permissions neatly so that you can conceptualize, well, this group of permissions relates to this, and this group of permissions relates to this. And I think, well, the code to set that up will be a little bit more complex. You do it once and then use the system for the next 20 years. And having put that investment in up front is going to pay off so many times. All right, so we have another uh, question. Could it be uh, extended to associate the uh, with data uh, set access policy? Let's say user A wants to access user B data, and once the consent is given, user A always gets access to user B data. Okay, excellent. So using the authorization service, you saw that we already made an extension on that, and it's that service um, especially that allows you to do an authorization check against an identity, a specific resource, and a policy. Now, you know that the permissions checks that we're using are already policy-based. We just got there in a fancy way. So you can use the authorization checks to do your resource-based uh, handling. Yeah, we have quite an interesting uh, comments as well. They like the uh, interactive notebooks. Oh, yes. Um, for, uh, it's, it's funny because I, I came in this morning and I said to JK, I, I need a better way to explain all this permission stuff that's happening. I think I'll, I'll fire up an interactive notebook. And I had to say to him, what's it called again? And we, we found the extension, coded it up in that. So yeah, I think that, that turned out well. Yeah, and at the, uh, at the beginning, there was a little bit confusion of why to go flexible, uh, not not in, uh, necessary from, you know, uh, the features, but um, why take the time to do it? I think you covered it uh, afterwards, but maybe just quick summarize. So when to go flexible? Yeah, so the ah. initial, uh, um, initial work more than, you know, why to go simple or flexible. The initial, oh, okay, so to, to use the standard approach, role-based, everything out of the box ASP.NET Core is simple to get started, right? It's there. It's not 100% simple because you still got to find a way to get those roles across to Blazor WebAssembly, which, which takes a little bit of configuration. It should just be out of the box. Um, but, but there's really nothing you need to do except start placing those authorized checks. Um, with the flexible approach, Yes, you have to write some code to get that up and running, or you could grab a NuGet uh, package that does the same thing, um, or maybe one day I'll make this into a NuGet package. Um, so yes, there is a little bit of an investment in startup, but we're not building it for simple or trivial applications. We're building it for uh, applications that will manage a lot of roles and that there is uh, anticipated to be changes in requirements to permissions. <laughs> 
Uh, and a few questions were there regarding Azure B2C. Yes. There's uh, roles in there. Right. And they were kind of already came to an answer in the comments, but might be mm -hmm. good to summarize it. Yeah. Uh, no why would you, for instance, use roles in ISP.NET Core, well, yep. ISP.NET, uh, rather than in Azure B2C? Yeah, that's a great question. This, this presentation, although I'm running um, ASP.NET Core Identity with Identity Server, it's not really the point. And it's not the point of where the roles or the permissions come from, because in the end, everything we were evaluating was just a claim, right? And it doesn't matter if that claim comes from Azure AD B2C, if it comes from Identity Server, it comes from somewhere else. That's what we're evaluating. So if we were using Azure AD B2C, um, we could simply establish a custom policy that then does a callback to our application to grab the permissions that would be associated with those B2C roles, and then to add that claim to the token and pass that back to our app. And we would have the same experience. So think of this more as we're looking at role-based access control and how that works, and that's the simple and the standard approach. And then we're looking at permissions-based access control, and we're looking at how that works, and we're leveraging ASP NetCore authorization to build a very flexible approach based on permissions-based access control. So it doesn't matter if we're using Auth0, B2C, or identity server, we can have the same approach. And just to be clear, we don't need to actually use Azure B2C. We can go say a thing like Auth0 or Microsoft Identity, right? You can just write it yourself. You can use the Caesar cipher to hide the password and just cover it all off yourself. <laughs> no, yeah, you, no, this is not specific to, to a certain authorization technology, okay? Um, you choose the technology that works for you and implement the strategy that works for you dependent on the complexity of your application. Yeah, and maybe to finish off uh, the questions, I don't see any new questions popping up unless this one. Okay, uh, so for instance, with permissions, if you want to add new permission, would that mean that you would go and update your code to add, add support for new permission, or can you do this dynamically? Well, um, I was thinking about that earlier, and I thought maybe it would be cool to use a source generator. Um, so we didn't have to play with the values being powers of two. I didn't have to create, you know, view um, access control as 128. Um, so it might not be nice to do that, but there's nothing to stop us from taking a completely different approach. Maybe um, we want to store the permissions and the association with roles in the database. We can do that. Obviously, what's going to change is the way that the policies are created. We might need a different strategy there. But um, other, otherwise, um, it's the same approach. We use policy-based authorization in ASP.NET Core to validate our authorization requirements for whatever it is that we're trying to access. Awesome. We'll just uh, do a quick uh, another question. So what is the best uh, feature in the uh, authentication um, in the new things that are coming in .NET 7, if you have looked at, or what not. you have done so far? <laughs> no, the only things I've looked at in .NET 7 has been, uh, actually, I can't remember what it is now. I did look at something else. Oh, it was the new minimal API, some advancements there, but um, yeah. I, I haven't I haven't checked out some new features. Have you? Have you? So there's a really good one uh, in it's .NET 7 preview. It's not permissions-based authorization, is it? But, but, it's kind of related to authorization, uh, yeah. authentication more. Okay. Uh, it's the uh, rate limiter. Okay, uh, yes. So the reason why it's connected is because what you can do is you can say a specific token can have, say, 10 requests per second. Yep. Uh, and that uh, will uh, specific uh, permissions. Uh, so what you can say is, if your admin say you can have 100 requests per second, mm -hmm. if you're a regular user, you have 10, and if you're not authenticated, you have zero. Okay. And they literally wrote like seven lines of code, and mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, oh, wait, we're now limiting everyone, which is like really, really awesome. Most of the limit uh, um, uh, rates uh, were basically either on the cloud, yeah. or you need to write a lot of code, lots of middleware That's to it. support it. Okay, awesome. Oh, that's good. Well, now that I've finished this presentation, I've got some time to check out and see what else is coming. Yeah, it's really awesome.
And with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the session, uh, the user group, and we will see you next time. Thank you for watching. See you later.